I, I see people are trickling in. Um, it's two minutes past, so um, good afternoon and welcome everybody to this uh, Translational Applications in Public Health Lecture. Um, this is a collaboration between the Institute for Public Health and Medicine, IFAM, and the Northwestern University Clinical and Translational Sciences, New Katz Institute. I'm Daniela Ladner. I'm a professor of surgery and a surgeon scientist. I want to thank everybody today for joining us. Um, during today's presentation, please use the Q&A function, not the chat. Um, to submit any questions you might have. Uh, we will have time at the end of the presentation um, for Q&A. So I want to introduce uh, Lisa, Dr. Lisa von Wagner. Um, I'm really happy to introduce her. She's an assistant professor in medicine in the Division of um, Hepatology. Uh, Lisa did graduated from college at NU with the magna cum laude and uh, went to medical school at University of Virginia and then came back uh, to Feinberg and did her both her residency and fellowship here. Um, she is a very accomplished young clinician scientist and amongst many um, elected um, uh, honor. She's been elected to the AOA. She's won countless awards. Most recently, uh, one of her papers was selected by the American Transplant Journal, the premier transplantation journal, um, for specifically uh, for her work on blood pressure control and transplantation. She's actually nationally already known for her work in cardiovascular risk and liver transplant and has been asked to give keynote talks around the country on the topic. And she served um, on the ASLD uh, practice guideline, which is um, <clears throat> specific to liver diseases. She served on committees, has been moderator uh, at national and international conferences. Um, Lisa is also on multiple editorial boards, including gastroenterology, which has a very high impact factor. In terms of her academic trajectory, I always use uh, Lisa von Wagner's trajectory as an example, how to ideally do it. Um, so she, and that's when I got to know her, she actually received an F32. Um, she, uh, we wanted to have her on our T32 and suggested that she instead submit an F32. And not only did she receive it, but she received a perfect score um, and uh, thereafter finished her clinical training. And as a junior faculty received a KL2, then followed by a K23. And she just received her first grant uh, as an independent investigator in R56, which is a first year grant for R1s that are very promising to bridge the time for resubmission. Um, she's published over 80 peer reviewed manuscript in high impact journal. And I think you get the idea. I mean, uh, Lisa von Wagner is the future um, and the present already. And um, I'm really proud to introduce her as the speaker today. Um, just to remind you again, if you have any questions, please use the question and answer tab rather than the chat. Well, thank you, Daniela, so much for that incredibly kind introduction. It is my absolute honor uh, to be here speaking on behalf of IFAM and NUCATS um, for this uh, Translational Applications and Public Health webinar. Um, and what we're going to do over the next uh, 45 minutes or so is talk about non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, or NAFLD, and cardiovascular risk, and what are the translational implications for us for clinical practice in 2021. All right. So these are my disclosures. Um, and most importantly, I do want to say that I will be discussing off-label use of some medications that are under current study for the treatment of both NAFLD and NASH. So my hope is by the end of today that you will be able to discuss the physiologic changes in the cardiovascular system that occurs in patients with NAFLD, and then describe the most common cardiovascular outcomes uh, within that patient space. 
We'll then move on to evaluating some approaches to targeting cardiovascular risk in the ongoing clinical trials that are being used to study uh, prospective drugs for this disease. And then we'll talk about ways in which we can use the knowledge um, from the epidemiologic studies that are out there targeting cardiovascular risk in NAPL patients um, into our clinical practice um, in patients that we're actually seeing who have this disease. So before I get started as a hepatologist, um, I feel like it's important that we understand the terminology of, of those of us who work in this space, sort of what we mean when we use the term NAFLD or non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And that term really represents an umbrella term that defines a wide spectrum of disease and disease severity that is associated with differential outcomes and risk. And so NAFLD um, refers to both patients who have what we call blank steatosis or just non-alcoholic fatty liver, which you can see in this liver biopsy specimen here, these white globules with this clearing here, these are fat droplets within liver cells. About 75% of patients with NAFLD will have bland steatosis. On the other hand, a quarter of patients will have fat plus inflammation, which is non-alcoholic steatohepatitis or NASH. And that is represented here. You can see these cells get enlarged. That's known as ballooning. And then we get these kind of dark purple inflammatory cells that come around alongside the hepatocytes. Um, and that's really the, the pathologic correlate or the histologic correlate to this disease state. About 20% of those patients with NASH will then go on to develop scar tissue or fibrosis related to the disease, which of course can progress through various stages and end in the final stage of fibrosis, otherwise known as cirrhosis. And when we think of liver-related outcomes, it's really the cirrhosis state that is most associated with the risk for decompensation and complications of cirrhosis and portal hypertension that then of course can precipitate death. Now, outside of this pathway, though related, is the risk for liver cancer. Um, although the highest risk is definitely among those patients who have cirrhosis due to NASH, there has been a large body of epidemiologic literature and case reports that have reported um, some increased risk, albeit small, um, in patients who maybe don't have cirrhosis but who have NASH and linking that to liver cancer risk. So another important outcome in this disease state. In terms of a prevalence and incidence of this disease, NAFLD and NASH in the adult population really is a global epidemic. Um, if you look here, you can see that the, the prevalence estimates vary widely depending on where in the world these patients may um, have come from. In the U.S., our prevalence is around 24% of Americans, um, with the highest prevalence actually among people who live in the Middle East at around 32%, and the lowest prevalence um, in Africa at around 13%. This translates to a worldwide prevalence of NAFLD at about 25%, and in certain subpopulations, such as those with type 2 diabetes, you can see in all the darker boxes here, patients worldwide with diabetes, more than half of type 2 uh, diabetic patients will have under underlying non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. So if you translate this to sort of general population prevalence based on the estimates we have on the previous slide, that means that the prevalence of NASH is somewhere between 1.5 to 6.5%. And the prevalence of NASH among those with type 2 diabetes is somewhere around 37%, and in some estimates as high as half. So this really is, when you think about it in terms of the millions and even billions of people who potentially are affected with the disease, a, a huge public health issue. So even though I'm a hepatologist, and that is my, my focus on, on, on many of the liver-related outcomes with this disease, NAFLD affects much more than just the liver. And of course, that's what we are going to focus on today. All of these different uh, disease conditions here have been associated in many bidirectionally with the development of NAFLD, or NAFLD has been associated with incident increased risk, these um, other cardiometabolic diseases, such that the most common cause of death and morbidity in patients with NAFLD is heart disease, and hence the focus of the talk today. And actually, the second leading cause of morbidity and mortality is cancer. The third leading cause is liver-related outcomes. So what are some of the pathophysiologic mechanisms that actually link the presence of having fat in your liver to cardiovascular disease? And I'm going to walk you through this slide a little bit. This is a nice review article that was written by uh, one of our formal former transplant hepatology fellows for Schroff, who's now a faculty member at UNC. Um, and what you can see here is, right, we know that diet, our genetic predisposition, the pre presence of obesity, these things all lead to adipose tissue expansion, um, which then through different pathways, whether it's through insulin resistant pathways or an increased availability of serum free fatty acids, leads to hepatic lipogenesis and fat being deposited in the liver. <laughs> 
And it's this phenotype of extra fat in the liver or fat plus inflammation that can really lead to systemic changes that's more than just the liver itself, of course, affects the heart and also can affect the kidneys, oncogenesis and other things. So first off, we know that the increase in hepatic triglyceride burden leads to altered lipid handling. And we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, direct hepatic lipotoxicity leads to a systemic inflammatory response. In patients with navel de Nash, there's also thought to be a prothrombotic state, which of course can lead to worsening of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease and increased risk for atherosclerotic events. You have endothelial dysfunction, which we'll talk just a little bit about. And then finally, there's been many studies that have shown that there are actually subclinical changes in cardiac structure and function that predate um, actual development of clinical heart failure in this patient population. And it's really all of these things in concert over time and long standing exposure to having fat in the liver that leads to increased cardiovascular risk. So we'll start by talking just a little bit about how NASH associates with an atherogenic lipid profile. So it's very well known, you know, clinically that a lipid profile um, of a patient who has a low high density um, lipoprotein cholesterol, HDL, is associated with increased risk of type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and cardiovascular related events. Um, these uh, particular changes are often referred to as diabetic or atherogenic dyslipidemia, and they're really most notable in patients who have type 2 diabetes, insulin resistance, or in the NAFLD population. We know, of course, also that LDL particles contribute to cardiovascular risk, and in clinical practice, most of us monitor LDL cholesterol in the general population in order to assess their future risk of cardiovascular events. However, atherogenic dyslipidemia is often associated with normal or maybe just slightly elevated LDL cholesterol levels. And therefore it can be very hard to actually accurately assess cardiovascular risk using LDL cholesterol alone. And so there's a huge body of literature and I can't get into all of the things today, um, but this really, if you look at the bottom of the slide here, it just basically shows some of the known pathways that lead to this atherogenic uh, dyslipidemia. Um, and one of the main pathways is, is highlighted here by this circle is that the majority of the LDL particles in these patients are really small and dense, and they carry a lot more triglyceride and less cholesterol esters and pre-cholesterol than the larger LDL particle we typically measure in the serum. And it's these small, dense LDLs that are highly atherogenic um, due to several factors, including their propensity to actually transverse the endothelium and then accumulate in lesions within the vessels um, and it has longer plasma half-life, um, more oxidation products. And this is what's been known to actually predispose um, to more um, atherosclerotic disease and cardiovascular events. And so this is the type of profile that we tend to observe in patients who have NAFLD. Another uh, mechanism that links to the increase in risk in cardiovascular disease is the fact that markers of oxidative stress and systemic inflammation are increased in NAFLD. So this is a really nice study using data from the Framingham Heart Study. Um, of course, for those who aren't familiar, Framingham is not a liver disease population. These are, these are people who have been followed now for you know, decades upon decades for the development of cardiovascular disease and has really taught us a lot of what we know about um, cardiovascular risk factors and, and how that imp, imp, um, implicates cardiovascular events um, in middle age. Um, and so this study really basically, they looked at multiple markers of inflammation and oxidative stress, and then they looked at NAFLD defined by cross-sectional imaging. So fat that was just incidentally found, these people did not know that they had fatty liver disease per se. And that's often how clinically we end up discovering fatty liver, people feel fat in their liver, it just gets picked up for other reasons on a scan. And so they looked at all these inflammatory markers. And what you can see on the graph here is they created an inflammatory index. And on the y axis is the prevalence of hepatic steatosis. And you can see as the number of inflammatory markers increased, the prevalence of steatosis on CT scan increased to wherein if you had five of these markers that were elevated, you had a nearly 50% chance of having NAFLD. So in addition to just having fat in your liver and a CT scan can't really differentiate fat from fat plus inflammation, it can't define the NASH phenotype. Um, in biopsy proven studies, and this is one example, um, has been shown that the NASH phenotype fibrosis in NASH associates with worse systemic inflammation. So this is an example using something known as high sensitivity C-reactive protein. Many may be familiar with this. We know in the general population, that this is a really strong predictor of future cardiovascular events um, when added to standard risk scores, uh, especially for patients who have intermediate cardiac risk. It's really good at actually differentiating who is at higher risk of having future cardiovascular events down the road. <laughs> 
And so in the study, they looked at biopsy uh, samples of patients had NASH and different gradations of fibrosis. And what you can see here is number one is that high sensitivity C-reactive protein is elevated in persons with NASH compared to simple steatosis. And on the graph here, you can see that as the hepatic fibrosis index increased, um, those patients had higher C-reactive protein and more advanced NASH-related fibrosis. So there is a stepwise increase in worsening systemic inflammation as the NASH phenotype progresses um, throughout the disease spectrum. NAFLD also associates with subclinical atherosclerosis and endothelial dysfunction. So this is a really nice meta-analysis that was recently published within the last couple of years in one of the um, liver disease journals called Hepatology Communications. This was uh, 26 observational studies. They had over 85,000 participants and about almost 30,000 NAFLD cases. And what they looked at is they looked at um, different markers of subclinical atherosclerosis. So they looked at carotid intimomedial thickness or, or carotid plaques in the carotid artery. They looked at coronary artery calcification scores. Again, um, a very strong marker of future cardiac risk and a cardiac event risk um, in the general population, as well as arterial stiffness. Um, and then a, another marker of endothelial dysfunction and known as flow-mediated vasodilation. And what you can see in this waterfall plot here is that persons who had NAFLD, um, you can see were much more likely and had much higher odds of, of having these subclinical markers um, than those who did did not have NAFLD. Now, of course, the limitations analysis um, was that it was most of the studies in this literature are, are mostly cross-sectional. There was a high heterogeneity between studies and definitely some potential publication bias. But I, I do want to say that, that these sort of trends um, have been seen across multiple different um, racial and ethnic populations and different areas of the world. This has been shown. Um, and it's been a fairly consistent result uh, over time that we've seen over the past 10 years linking um, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease um, to these subclinical markers. Um, I want to share this data because um, I, I'm biased to say I think it's really interesting because it comes from data here that we uh, published uh, from Northwestern, uh, specifically from the CARDIA study, uh, which is the coronary artery risk development in young adults. Uh, which is a population-based study that Northwestern has been participating in now for 35 years. Um, and in 1985 to 1986, we enrolled uh, black and white young adults um, across four sites in the US and we've now been following them for 35 years. At the year 25 examination, which occurred in 2010, we did cross-sectional imaging of the abdomen um, in order to look at fat uh, deposits in, in the um, abdomen and of course in the liver to define the NAFLD phenotype. And in this study, um, we had a little over 1,800 participants who had CT-defined NAPLs and who also had echocardiography or ultrasound of the heart done at the year 25 exam, so at the same time they got the CT. And then five years later, they got another echocardiogram. So again, remember, these are unselected patients free of cardiovascular disease at baseline. Their mean age uh, was 50 years. And what we showed was that having fat in your liver on a CT scan was associated with incidence of uh, left ventricular hypertrophy, um, abnormal left ventricular geometry. So these are markers that are highly associated with development of cardiovascular events, particularly the heart failure down the road, and something known as myocardial strain, worst myocardial strain, which is a, again, this is a subclinical marker for the likelihood of somebody developing um, a future heart failure event. Um, and this was independent of multiple traditional heart failure risk factors. Um, this was independent of weight gain over that five-year period, um, as well as, um, of, of, as um, sex and race as well. So um, very interesting um, studies um, that I had the privilege to participate in um, here at Northwestern. Um, so with that, um, not just NAFLD, right, or, or fat defined on CT scan, but NASH, IAPSI proven NASH, also associates with changes in the geometry in the left ventricle, um, especially in a population of bariatric surgery patients. So what you can see here, and um, this would be a hepatologist explanation of, of changes in LV geometries um, uh, from a uh, non-cardiology standpoint, but right here's like what a normal heart wall and a normal heart volume of the, of the left ventricular chamber would look like. And, you you know, as the heart um, is under stress or strain um, from systemic inflammation or, or you know, um, increased cardiac output or other things that happen in, in obesity, um, the, there are changes that occur in different patterns in both the wall thickness, right? You get a, can have a very thick wall and remodeling here, 
or you can develop a, a, a thick wall and the chamber size increases, or you can have mostly chamber size increase, but maintain your wall thickness. And these different patterns have been associated with different phenotypes and different risk um, for different cardiovascular outcomes. So what these studies showed is in, in patients who were undergoing bariatric surgery, they had liver biopsies taken at the time, just over 200 patients. They had echocardiograms that were performed preoperatively. And they showed that biopsy proven NASH versus simple fatty liver was associated with all kinds of changes in left ventricular function on those um, pre-surgery um, echocardiograms and specifically changes in diastolic function. So one of the most common clinical things that we tend to see in patients um, with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease in terms of heart failure events tends to be this failure with preserved ejection fraction or half pass. Um, and, and these things were all independent of obesity and uh, again, other heart failure risk factors. So again, more proof of concept that it's not just the simple steatosis, but that having more inflammation um, in fatty liver disease and potentially even more fibrosis is a stronger risk factor for having more adverse cardiac events. So just a word on the role of NAFLD and electrical conduction and arrhythmia risk. Um, so cardiac remodeling and those changes in the ventricular size and the wall thickness, of course, change, right, how the electrical system of the heart is going to respond to stress and also predisposes patients to having arrhythmias and arrhythmic events down the road. And this has been shown in the general population, but it's also been shown in patients with NASH. So just one example using our own data here at Northstern, and this is what's depicted here on this screen. Graph. We looked at over 9,000 patients who had a diagnosis of NAFLD or NASH by ICD codes within the NMEDW. Um, and we showed that overall, um, the AFib prevalence in our data set at Northwestern um, was about 5.6% in adults um, aged greater um, than 65. And what you can um, uh, see here is that if we compare those who had NASH, they had a prevalence of about 2.7% um, with uh, AFib prevalence. If you compare that to the published general literature population of the prevalence of AFib, it was 2%. So it was almost a basically 50% increased um, risk of having underlying AFib diagnosis if you had a diagnosis of NASH versus if you did not. This has been substantiated um, uh, in multiple other studies, but a nice recent meta-analysis that was done of 19 studies, over 7 million different individuals that did show that NAFLD was independently associated with higher risks for AFib than persons with non-NAFLD with these point estimates here. So with all this data, sort of going through some of the different potential pathophysiologic mechanisms linking fat in the liver to cardiac disease, the question of course becomes, well, is it really the NAFLD? Is it the fat in the liver um, that's really the risk factor for actual hard cardiovascular event outcomes? Or is it just because NAFLD patients tend to have more cardiometabolic comorbidities, they have more type 2 diabetes, metabolic syndrome, and that's really what's driving the risk? And that's been a tough question to get at. And so over the next couple of slides, I want to show you some data that supports the hypothesis that perhaps NAFLD really is an independent risk factor for development of actual hard cardiovascular outcomes. So what I'm showing you here, this is a landmark meta-analysis that was published in our leading hepatology journal, which is Journal of Hepatology, a couple of years ago now. It was 16 studies, over 34,000 adult participants. The NAFL prevalence was actually a bit higher um, than the population prevalence I showed you previously at 36 percent. They had 2,600 fatal and non-fatal cardiovascular events. Um, though um, more than 70% uh, of these were actual cardiovascular deaths. Um, and it was over a median follow-up time of about seven years. And um, what you can see here, right, so um, on the top here um, are fatal cardiovascular events. Um, NAFLD was not uh, statistically um, associated with fatal events, but the composite of fatal and non-fatal and particularly non-fatal cardiovascular events was significant. So if you look at this in composite, um, it did appear that independent of uh, baseline cardiac risk factors, that NAFLD seemed to be independently associated with actual hard cardiac outcomes. Now, of course, the major limitations to many of this in the published literature up until 2016 had been that baseline cardiovascular disease or cardiac uh, coronary heart disease was not universally assessed in all these studies. Um, there was also incomplete adjustment for right dynamic change in the development of cardiovascular risk factors over time. And then finally, many of these studies did not have well adjudicated um, cardiovascular event outcomes. So that brings us uh, 
to this next study, um, which I think is really interesting and literally just came out this year in um, uh, clinical gastroenterology and hepatology. Um, uh, again, another one of our, our leading clinical GI and hepatology journals. It uses data um, from the PROMISE trial. Um, so PROMISE, for those who aren't familiar, um, was a study that was designed to compare the effectiveness of two non-invasive testing strategies, CT, coronary angiography, or, or functional stress testing for detection of coronary artery disease in outpatients who were coming in with chest pain um, across over 190 sites in America between 2010 and 2013. So the objective of, of the study here was to compare rates of incident major adverse uh, cardiovascular events, or MACE, by steatosis status controlling for um, all these uh, different risk factors that were, of course, limitations in prior studies. And the reason they could do this in PROMISE is you can see here, right, 50% of people in this were, were randomized to get a CT coronary angiography. And what happens when you get a chest CT is you also capture the top part of the liver. And what you can do is you can go back and actually look at um, that liver, those liver sections and assess whether or not people have potential prevalent fatty liver disease. And that's exactly what they did. So among those, they had a, a just um, under 4,000 um, who actually had adequate liver and spleen imaging to actually calculate a ratio and quantify liver fat. And they had a fatty liver prevalence very close to that global estimate of 25% that I showed you before. So this was really a nested cohort study from the PROMISE trial. And this is what they found. First off, they found what we would expect, right? That steatosis at baseline was associated with having a higher prevalence of obesity, metabolic syndrome, diabetes, um, cardiovascular risk burden. If you looked at their ASCVD risk scores, they had a higher risk score burden than persons who did not have fat. They had higher what's known as the Lehman score. So this is a score that they use to, to basically quantify total obstructive and non-obstructive coronary disease burden on CT imaging. And they had higher CAC scores, which we've talked before. There were no or very small differences in, in the total atherosclerotic burden by, by coronary CT angiography, um, and there was no difference in the proportion of high-risk plaques, calcified or non-calcified plaques. So over a median follow-up time of just over two years, um, they had an overall major adverse cardiovascular event rate of 3.1%. And they demonstrated here that baseline steatosis was associated with significantly higher MACE, 4.4% in patients with fatty liver versus 2.6% in those who did not with an adjusted hazard ratio that you, um, of 1.72 that you can see on this graph here. And, and really importantly is that this hazard ratio was adjusted for the pre presence of significant stenosis in the coronary arteries at baseline, the ASCVD risk score burden, obesity status, and components of the metabolic syndrome. So this data, you know, really strongly suggests that perhaps, you know, in a, in a well-designed, you know, prospective way with good adjudicated outcomes, very rigorously assessed cardiovascular risk factors, that perhaps NAFL does have a, a role as an independent risk factor. And I think this graph from this paper is, is, is the most interesting. And what they did here is, of course, they looked at um, uh, whether or not you had significant coronary artery disease at baseline, and they stratified each of the groups by the presence of hepatic steatosis. So in the green lines at the bottom, these are people who had no coronary disease on CT at baseline. Um, and then the solid line um, shows you those who had fatty liver, and the dotted line shows you those who did not, and then for each of the gradations above. And you can see that in each strata, having the presence of fatty liver added um, additional um, risk to your baseline hazard um, for any strata of, of severity of coronary artery disease with the highest risk among persons in the top line who had both significant fatty liver and who had significant steatosis um, with a really, really impressive, uh, impressive adjusted hazard ratios for, for two-year um, major adverse cardiac events. So with this information and sort of with this large body of literature in mind, I now want to take us to thinking about how do we now take this information and think about how do we write translate, this is translational seminars, how do we translate this to our approach to targeting cardiovascular risk in this patient population that many of us are seeing? So first off, we learned from the studies um, uh, that have been done to date is that the strongest predictors of actual hard incident cardiovascular events in NAVLD have been shown to be ASCVD risk score, smoking status, and the presence of having a sedentary lifestyle. On the bottom of this slide, you can see the things that have been investigated but have not yet been shown 
setting of NAFLD or NASH to be independent risk factors for incident based events. So age, gender, race, diabetes, obesity status, family history, Framingham risk score, even ALT level. So far, those have not panned out to be strong independent risk factors. So not to say these things are, of course, are not important cardiovascular risk factors. It's just that in the NASH population, um, these have not panned out as sort of the strongest drivers of risk. What's also really interesting and important to note is that, you know, from a clinical standpoint, does knowing what somebody's NASH status is and what their fibrosis status is, does that affect how we think about cardiac risk? Or can we just call everybody NAFLD and leave it at that? We don't have to worry about, you know, how severe the disease is. So this was a study that used M something called MR elastography, which in our liver world is the most um, sensitive and specific way we have of looking non-invasively at whether or not somebody has um, potential underlying fibrosis or scar tissue in the liver. And so what they did here is they had, as it's a single center study, it was just over 400 patients. Um, and uh, this is how they defined cardiovascular disease. Um, and, and what they showed here is, is interesting in, in a couple of different ways. Number one, it's sort of what I showed you at the beginning of the talk, right? That the green line here in patients who had the highest stiffness, who had defined cirrhosis by imaging, had the lowest incidence of cardiovascular disease. And we can all hypothesis, hypothesize, right, that that's probably because the, the competing risk of liver related outcomes, the competing risk of liver cancer, the competing risk of decompensation and death from liver disease is the primary driver of outcomes in patients with cirrhosis as opposed to their cardiac risk. But what they showed very nicely here is the black line here is patients who did not have cirrhosis, but had mild fibrosis. And the red line is the non-cirrhosis population, but that had moderate to advanced fibrosis. And you can see that the more fibrosis you had by MR elastography, the more likely your cumulative incidence of having significant cardiovascular disease. So knowing somebody's cirrhosis status helps us to differentiate, of course, what's the risk of having a liver outcome versus having a cardiac, um, cardiometabolic outcome. And then knowing what their fibrosis status is in the non cirrhotic population is very important potentially for understanding their differential risk for future cardiovascular events. So knowing this information and doing this risk assessment, what are some of the things that we could potentially recommend? What is the data underlying some clinical practice recommendations um, to actually help change or alter risk in this population? So the first off becomes right diet. That's what patients want to know. What can I do? What can I eat that might make a difference in my cardiac risk? Of course, we're very familiar with the fact that the Mediterranean diet has been widely studied in the general population, um, has been touted for its benefits, of course, for cardiovascular risk reduction with the components of the diet that are shown on this slide, right? Very um, high in dietary fiber, um, lean cuts of, of meat and fish, um, high in you know, um, uh, monounsaturated and polyunsaturated fats and, and, and plant-based type proteins. Um, this has also been shown, the Mediterranean diet is by far the most studied in NAFLD for its benefits in hepatic fat reduction. Um, and it's been shown to reduce liver fat even if patients do not lose weight. Um, and there's been trials both in the diabetes population and in persons without diabetes. And it's definitely the most recommended in our current clinical practice guidelines. So it has benefits for both cardiac risk reduction and for fatty liver risk reduction. In terms of other uh, ways to change lifestyle and, 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 and modulate risk and improve risk, bariatric surgery um, is definitely um, something that has been highly studied. And, and I wanna highlight this because this is literally hot off the press from JAMA um, that was published online just last week, looking at um, actual hard clinical outcomes, um, both liver and cardiovascular related outcomes in patients who had biopsy proven NASH. So what you see here in panel A is that bariatric surgery um, versus non-surgical control group um, significantly significantly um, reduced um, the cumulative incidence of major adverse liver-related outcomes with impressive hazard ratios here of 0.12. Uh, and then same thing here for cardiovascular um, events in panel B on the right-hand side um, with a hazard ratio of 70% um, uh, reduced hazard of having a, a cumulative uh, major adverse cardiovascular event compared to controls. So again, sort of another feather in the cap for patients who have an indication for bariatric surgery, um, and um, they also potentially have NAFLD or NASH, um, this may be a, a reasonable therapeutic approach for, for modulating their cardiac risk and um, their risk for poor liver-related outcomes. So what about exercise in NAFLD? Um, in terms of the quality of evidence here, most of the studies in NAFLD have been relatively short. They last majority between about eight and 12 weeks. Um, but what they have shown is that exercise, even without weight loss, 
um, does produce about a 20 to 30% relative reduction in, in fat in the liver. So there are benefits of exercise, just like we know for cardiovascular health, um, apart from weight loss um, that are beneficial for this population. Uh, different forms of exercise, whether it's aerobic exercise or high intensity intermittent does appear to have similar effects on liver fat. So what I tell patients, of course, is I just want you to move. It doesn't matter how you move. I just want you to move. And we know that's going to actually improve your health from both a liver and, um, and a heart disease standpoint. Um, the other important point, of course, is if you don't use it, you lose it, right? And we've seen this in all the large major, you know, in lifestyle intervention trials in, in the cardiology space, the general population and diabetes. If patients, you know, get enrolled and they do an exercise intervention and then they stop exercising at the end of the trial, those cardiovascular and those liver related benefits do um, regress back, back to baseline and they will re often regain that liver fat. Um, unfortunately, there have not been any good biopsy proven studies on the effect of exercise in NAPL to date. So the recommendation and, and what's in most of our clinical practice guidelines are to encourage patients to engage in at least 150 minutes per week of moderate physical activity. Um, this is a similar recommendation to what we recommend in the general population for cardiovascular risk reduction. So as a hepatologist, I feel like um, this is the slide that I that I have to have in here to talk about what about the role of alcohol in NAPLD, um, specifically because as we know, there's been a lot of data about the potential benefits um, for you know red wine use and and, and moderate versus um, alcohol use versus completely abstaining for alcohol um, in the general population for cardiac risk reduction. So number one thing I have to say is of course in patients with cirrhosis absolutely no alcohol due to the very well-established increased risk for, for liver cancer. But the question becomes is, is there a role for moderate alcohol use in patients who do not have cirrhosis? And there was a large meta-analysis that came out um, a couple of years ago that suggested that there was perhaps a 31% reduction in NAPL preval prevalence among persons who use moderate alcohol versus those who abstained. There's also been some data in the NASH population uh, from the CARDIA study that we've published, um, as well as some other studies now that showed maybe a trend towards lower hemoglobin A1C and diabetes prevalence. Um, we were unable to show in CARDIA and um, the MESA studies recently published some data on this as well. Um, it does not appear to have any apparent cardiovascular disease risk reduction or reduction in those markers of subclinical cardiac disease we talked about before. So no difference in CAC score, no difference in those echocardiographic markers of subclinical disease like myocardial pain or, or you know, changes in chamber size um, in those who use moderate alcohol versus those who abstained. Um, and I think at, you know, from a scary standpoint, there in, in the largest biopsy um, um, study that we have called the NASH Clinical excuse me, NASH Clinical Research Network or NASH CRN sponsored by the NIDDK, they demonstrated that persons who use moderate alcohol versus abstainers um, had potential for worse histologic outcomes on biopsy. Of course, from a clinical standpoint, it's very difficult to potentially recommend or even advise on alcohol in this population because how much really is moderate? If you look at the meta-analysis and you look at the studies that have been published in this space, there is high heterogeneity of what is defined as moderate. Um, and of course, we know that standard drink and how much ethanol is in a standard drink varies widely based on where patients are in the world, right? A standard drink in the U.S. has much less uh, grams of ethanol per um, milliliter than, say, a drink in Japan. And that's very important when we're talking about counseling patients. And then the final thing is that there's been a, a nice large body of literature now that has shown that binge drinking is worse than regular light to moderate drinking. So I think this is an important clinical practice point um, is that counseling patients on not using, you know, um, binge drinking defined as more than five drinks on an occasion, um, that kind of behavior um, is, is actually worse than maybe having a, a glass of wine per day. So very important uh, counseling for our patients. So the bottom line here, argument really in favor of complete abstinence in most patients is that we know that alcohol hepatotoxicity is modulated by more things than we can possibly accurately measure in clinical practice. There are genetic, physiologic, behavioral factors that are just really hard for us to, to accurately attain in order to make um, um, really a good um, risk-based recommendations to patients. Dosage and serving size limits may be interpreted in different ways. And then we know, right, that cardiovascular benefits are really attainable through much more well-established means. Um, than a glass of wine a day. So that being said, of course, there are many patients who are going to choose to continue to drink. Um, and so when my patients do ask me about alcohol, um, you know, I do say if you are going to choose to continue to drink, um, number one, you need to make sure that you're accounting for alcohol-derived calories when you're setting caloric limits. And then, of course, number two, 
um, that um, we know that um, the alcohol hepatotoxicity differs by sex um, and um, by, um, by race and ethnicity. So in women, the general recommendation is no more than one um, standard alcohol beverage per day. And in men, we tend to say no more than two. So um, just a slide here to talk about statins and NASH, because um, this is a very hot topic in the liver world and, and definitely comes up in clinical practice all the time. You know, are statins a good thing? Are they potentially harmful? Should we be using them? And, and do they do they potentially have benefits beyond their cardiovascular risk reduction? So there are have been lots of studies, um, both um, in basic science and in translational applications for looking at the potential role of statins for reducing uh, steatosis reducing inflammation and, and potentially even having an antifibrotic role. And in patients and in, in mouse models of portal hypertension, potentially even reducing portal pressures. And I think really interesting in large epidemiologic studies now have been shown uh, to potentially reduce um, the risk for um, incident uh, liver cancer, particularly among the lipophilic statins more than the hypophilic statins. Um, I'll just make a quick plug and a note to say that um, this is such an exciting topic right now that the um, NADDK has recently funded a large liver cirrhosis network um, that um, uh, congratulate Northwestern and um, NUCATS and NUDAC, which is our Northwestern University Data Coordinating Center um, that is um, uh, co-PI'd now by Daniela Ladner, who did the introduction today, and Dr. Jody Cialino. Um, and they, we are now the Data Coordinating Center for this large uh, prospective cohort study that's going to be have a statin intervention clinical trial in patients with cirrhosis uh, to see if this potentially um, is, has benefit for our patients in preventing hepatic decompensation. So much more to come in the coming years. But the bottom line here is really that statins are absolutely safe to use in patients with NASH. They should be used for cardiovascular risk reduction, and they may have benefits beyond their cardiovascular risk reduction um, actually on liver-related outcomes, so more data is needed. So what about aspirin and NAFLD? This is, again, an, another story sort of similar to statins that we know, right, that aspirin has established benefits for secondary prevention in cardiovascular disease, especially atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, and potential, right, for primary prevention in certain high-risk subpopulations. Um, this was a nice prospective cohort study of over 300 adults with biopsy-confirmed uh, NAFLD, and they looked at incident advanced fibrosis using uh, different serial measurements and different validated indices that we use in clinical practice to assess fibrosis. And what they showed here um, that you can see here um, in the uh, blue line is that daily aspirin use was associated with a much uh, lower odds of having NASH and fibrosis, um, and that the greatest benefit was in persons who use them for more than four years of continuous use, and that non-aspirin NSAID use had no association, again, just really supporting that aspirin um, may have more um, benefit in NAFLD beyond cardiovascular prevention, um, though there were no cardiovascular outcomes in this patient population specifically reported um, in this study um, that just came out about two years ago. So in the last um, uh, couple minutes that we have together, I want to talk just a little bit about sort of the therapeutic space um, and what we might be able to expect from a cardiovascular risk reduction standpoint of the currently available therapies that are out there and are being studied for this disease. So first off, I have to say there are no FDA approved treatments for NASH um, as of today, um, but there are many in the pipeline and there are many agents that are currently available for other indications that have been studied in NASH that may have potential benefit. So um, the most familiar to many of you um, may be uh, pioglitazone and vitamin E. This was studied in the landmark Pivens trial that was published in New England Journal of Medicine about a decade ago now. Um, and um, in patients with diabetes, um, pioglitazone was shown to potentially reduce NASH um, and vitamin E in, in patients um, who did not have diabetes. And we know, right, that in terms of these cardiovascular markers, in terms of changes in lipids, glucose lowering and blood pressure lowering, that these agents, um, you know, do have potential benefits. Um, and, and differential uh, risk that may actually lead to an impact on cardiac outcomes. Metformin, um, widely used um, in this patient population, has been studied um, in NAFLD and NASH. It has not shown as promising a benefit for its NASH um, uh, risk reduction in terms of its ability to actually change inflammatory pathways and change fibrosis. But of course, it has been shown in some studies for LDL lowering, and of course, it lowers glucose. Um, the more exciting space in the NASH world is really uh, the potential for semaglutide, uh, GLP-1 agonist, and then, of course, the SGLT-2 inhibitors, canagliflozin and empagliflozin. Um, and I think we're all very uh, aware, right, of the data that has come out, um, particularly for the SGLT-2s and their, you know, potential uh, changes and uh, favorable changes 
um, in cardiometabolic profile um, and cardiovascular risk. Um, and then semaglutide, of course, for its additional benefit and the fact that patients tend to lose weight on this drug, especially at the higher doses. And then these are the drugs that are currently in these three trials. The first of which is obeta-colic acid being studied in the Regenerate trial. Um, this is an FXR agonist. It's actually currently marketed under the drug name Acoliva for the treatment of primary biliary or secondary treatment of primary biliary um, uh, cholangitis. Um, the problem with obeta-colic acid is um, it has been shown to actually have a opposite effect from a cardiovascular risk standpoint. It increases LDL cholesterol and lowers HDL cholesterol further um, because of, of its mechanism of action um, um, in, in bile metabolism um, and has and, and, um, and lipid handling. Um, but um, I will say in um, additional studies, um, the use of a statin um, with obeta acid has been shown to normalize these profiles. So um, this is a drug to watch out for. The other one is Aramacol, um, which is an SD, SCD1 inhibitor. Um, which basically plays a role in lipogenesis. Um, there haven't been any studies really that have been published quite yet looking at um, uh, parameters and how these might change from a cardiovascular standpoint. And then the final one that I think is really interesting is uh, Mineron um, uh, being studied in the Maestro trial. This is a thyroid hormone receptor beta agonist. So these are the receptors for thyroid hormone that are specific to the liver, whereas the alpha receptors are the ones in which you tend to get the cardiovascular, um, adverse cardiovascular outcomes related to, to, to thyroid hormone. And um, so this has been shown to, um, was recently published this last year um, to lower LDLC, um, um, but these other markers have not yet been reported on yet um, and is a very promising uh, new drug. So just a couple of clinical pearls, um, if somebody is being considered for off-label use of these therapies in terms of their ability for cardiovascular risk reduction, there are of course pluses and minuses to all these medications for other outcomes that I'm not discussing today. Um, so in terms of vitamin E, um, the cardiovascular considerations, of course, there's been a lot of large epidemiologic studies in the general population um, that have shown um, its potential to reduce stroke. Um, and there were signals in some studies about potential increased risk for mortality and particularly um, um, driven by increased risk for heart failure and perhaps hemorrhagic stroke, as opposed to the um, re reduction in ischemic stroke, um, really needs to be reserved um, in the, in the non-diabetes population, and that's where most of the data lies. In terms of pioglitazone and its effect on, on cardiac outcomes, um, potential increased risk for heart failure hospitalization, so there has been data that has shown that it potentially reduces um, MACE, non-fatal MI, and non-fatal stroke. And then again, um, you know, I think probably the strongest data that we have, um, of course, is, is for semaglutide and the SGLT2s in terms of their ability to lower uh, cardiovascular outcomes, and then particularly the SGLT2s in terms of heart failure risk reduction and renal protection. So if you treat the NAFLD, if, if, if you send somebody to the hepatologist and they try to do something um, to actually lower fat in the liver, is this gonna make any impact on cardiac risk? So sort of flipping things on its head, we can do all these things to lower cardiac risk and it's safe to do it in NAFL, but what if we actually direct therapies at the fatty liver itself? So this was a post hoc analysis of that PIVINS trial I talked about, so pioglitazone and vitamin E. And they looked at the people who actually achieved NASH resolution, um, whether it was through vitamin E or whether it was through pioglitazone. Um, and independent of treatment arm, they showed that these patients had lower serum triglycerides, they had higher HDL, they had an increase in their LDL particle size, and they had lower Framingham risk scores. So they did not look at hard cardiovascular outcomes, but it's sort of just proof of concept that per perhaps targeting inflammation and perhaps targeting fibrosis and NASH may be an additional way down the road as more therapeutic agents become available that we might want to be thinking about lowering cardiovascular risk in this population. Now, of course, the problem in these cardiovascular clinical trials is None of them are powered to really look at cardiovascular disease endpoints. Um, and that's because, and this is, um, I'm uh, again, want to say uh, tra transparently that I'm borrowing the slide um, um, from this article here, back of the envelope type uh, uh, calculations that if you look at, you know, assume a 2% serious adverse cardiac event rate over 18 months, which is basically what has been observed um, in um, the, um, Regenerate um, uh, placebo group that has 220 patients in it. So Regenerate is that, um, that abetacolic acid drug that we talked about. If we assume a 25% risk reduction in major adverse cardiac events, and I got that 25% number because that is the same rate in which semaglutide reduced cardiovascular events in the large cardiovascular prevention 
population study. We assume our sort of standard statistical alpha 0.05, two-sided p-value, 80% power, assume it's a five-year study. We would need over 6,000 patients, so 3,000 patients per group in order to be adequately powered um, to look at, at cardiovascular endpoints. And this is currently three times larger than any of the current phase three trials that are underway for NASH today that we just talked about previously. Of course, we also have to consider, right, the competing risk of liver-related death in patients with cirrhosis. So some of these trials are um, more heavily uh, enrolled towards patients with advanced fibrosis and cirrhosis. And of course, that number is going to get even higher because of the competing risks. On the other hand, if we want to think about trial design, right, we could enrich the sample only with patients who had prior cardiovascular disease and look at this more for secondary prevention, and that might allow us to have some reduced numbers. Another approach, right, to looking at cardiovascular endpoints in NASH trials would be to consider post-marketing or phase four trials, um, looking, of course, at the effectiveness of these drugs in the real world and safety endpoints, uh, either through clinical trial or observational designs. Um, of course, the challenges of phase four bills, you know, standardized data collection and reporting, who's going to do that? What's the case ascertainment? Who owns the data? Is it the FDA? Is it the drug companies? And then how are these things going to be funded? They can still be very expensive and they're still going to require thousands of patients for us to accurately follow in order to determine if any of these new agents truly reduce hard cardiovascular endpoints. So um, just to sort of summarize a therapy, one therapeutic approach to reduce cardiovascular risk and potentially also modify liver disease in patients with NAPLD. Um, this is just sort of a summary of the things that we talked about here. So right, in all adults with NAPLD, the baseline of therapy, regardless of severity of disease, is going to be lifestyle interventions with physical activity, Mediterranean diet recommendations, and limiting things that we know are associated with worsening disease outcomes in the state. Then, of course, in persons who have under these underlying metabolic uh, conditions, we want to consider statin treatments and those who have a good indication for it. We didn't talk much about um, uh, hypertension treatment, but um, there has been data in the um, uh, patients with cirrhosis and advanced fibrosis about the potential use of ACE inhibitors and particularly ARBs um, for uh, their potential antifibrotic hepatic effects. We want to do uh, offer smoking cessation, right? That's one of the strongest risk factors for heart outcomes in this disease. In patients, who have an indication for a GLP-1 or an SGLT-2, we want to consider those as potential first-line agents for their potential benefits for both fatty liver disease and cardiac risk reduction. And then, of course, can talk about or consider pioglitazone if the patient does not have a history of heart failure. In terms of obesity management, um, the goal that we tend to use, the target is a 10% body weight loss. That's really what's been shown in studies to potentially reverse liver fat um, through a hypocaloric diet um, and then medication or bariatric surgery when clinically indicated. And then, of course, if we're talking about secondary prevention, absolutely need to be talking about um, aspirin use and statins in this population. So in conclusion, uh, systemic inflammation, atherogenic dyslipidemia, endothelial dysfunction, cardiac remodeling, and altered electrical conduction are all of the pathophysiologic mechanisms that likely contribute to progressive cardiovascular disease in patients with NAPLD and NASH. We know that NAFLD is associated with approximately a 70% increased risk of MACE, independent of tradi traditional risk factors compared to adults who do not have NAFLD. And the pipeline therapies and off-label use of the current agents in the pipeline are most likely to exert their potential benefits in NAFLD um, by reduction of the atherosclerotic factors, and therefore are most like to, likely to actually change atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease endpoints, not necessarily the other cardiovascular disease endpoints um, that um, have not been as, as heavily studied in this disease. And then finally, a therapeutic approach to cardiac risk reduction in NAFLD and clinical practice really needs to target the underlying mechanisms that are associated with the development of cardiac disease in patients with NAFLD. So um, I want to take a minute and um, just acknowledge um, all uh, my mentors and collaborators. I particularly want to thank uh, Don Lloyd-Jones, who, of course, I'm sure everybody here knows. Um, he has um, been mentoring me for a very long time um, uh, since my fellowship time um, and, and, and really has helped me uh, to develop uh, my knowledge base in, in this space of cardiovascular epidemiology and patients with liver disease. Um, thanks to John Pandolfino, my division chief, who's been incredibly supportive of, of this research program. And then, as Daniela mentioned, a lot of research that I do is in, in the transplant space and supported by the transplant center and the CTC and new torg um, as well. And of course, want to thank new cats specifically um, for their support of my career development, um, as I was a prior uh, KL2 trainee and many of the things I presented today were done while I L2. So uh, again, acknowledge my the funding bodies that supported this work. Um, I thank you for your time and I very much look forward to your questions. <laughs>
Lisa, what a wonderful talk. Thank you so much. Uh, this really was a whirlwind of um, information really nicely put together. Um, and, and there's, I please want to encourage people to put uh, your questions in the question and answer box. There's uh, one question here, but um, I, I am going to start with a question of my own. Um, you know, this this is obviously a huge body of work and you're working in this space. So I guess two questions. One is, what is the most ex exciting area of research for you going forward? And where do you see um, potential collab collaborations, especially for the, there's many people here that might be interested to collaborate that are not transplant clinicians or not cardiologists, where do you see potential there? And then I'll go with yeah. some questions. That's a great question, Daniela. Um, you know, I think, you know, right, as I sort of highlighted at the end, despite all these, you know, fancy tests and high level things that we do, the backbone of therapy and the backbone to cardiovascular risk reduction in this space and in the general population is through the lifestyle modification. And um, we really need great collaborators who understand implementation science and interventions that um, are going to be acceptable to patients and communities um, to be able to move the needle on this disease. This is a massive public health problem um, that requires um, systemic and system-wide um, approaches to prevention and management. By the time somebody gets to my liver clinic, or for heaven's sakes, by the time they get to you or I for a transplant evaluation, it's really too late. Um, and, and we're not going to move the needle um, um, on the epidemic of NAFLD um, if we don't interact, uh, intervene sooner. So I think that's really the most promising space for people looking to get into this is, is really on those types of interventions um, on a public health level. There's a question here from Colleen uh, Blackshear. Are there any data relating to certain genetic polymorphisms which confer higher risks for NASH? Uh, she mentioned the example of PNPLA3 uh, and in relation to higher uh, cardiovascular risk. Yeah, Colleen, that's a great question. And yes, there is. And I at one point had a slide in there and then in the interest of time, I ended up taking that out. Um, but yes, there there have been studies and, and, and very it's, it's conflicting and difficult data to sort of tease through because as, as Colleen points out, there, there have been genetic polymorphisms that are more associated with, with the predisposition to put fat in the liver and more severe disease phenotype. And that most common one is this PNPLA3. There are others. Um, and those have been looked at in terms of their uh, potential for cardiac risk, uh, uh, increasing cardiac risk. And it, the opposite has actually been found in many of the risk factors is that people who carry the genetic polymorphism for whatever reason seem to have a lower cardiovascular risk, um, which is sort of counterintuitive. And there have been a lot of studies now that have tried to tease out the reasons for that. And there's a lot of confounders and, and the studies have, have, have had a difficult time sort of teasing out that reason why. Um, and, and some of it just may uh, be due to the study design. So I don't think we really fully understand um, if somebody who had, carries one of these genetic polymorphisms truly has the same cardiovascular risk um, if they have NASH versus somebody who does it, perhaps maybe even has lower or maybe even has higher risk. So those are great questions. And that is definitely an area right for investigation. Another question from uh, Satish Nadi. Um, do you know what effects NAFLD has on the endothelia specifically? Yeah, no, that's a great point. So um, um, really most of what we've seen in terms of the role of NAFLD on endothelial dysfunction is through um, pathways that increase release of nitric oxide. One, one pathway that I didn't talk about was the role of the microbiome um, in NAFLD, which is a, a whole nother talk in and of itself. Um, and that's another huge area of, of, of investigation right now. And we know, right, that there's changes in the microbiome, changes in gut bacteria and microbiota um, with that have differential change in the ability to release nitric oxide that has also been shown to influence on endothelial function. Um, so those are some of, the, I think, the most um, studied pathways and how uh, endothelial function changes in patients with NAFLD. It's a great question. And uh, Adrian Raigoza is asking, what type of interventions would you suggest for insulin resistance in regard to fat in the liver? Mm, that's a great one. So this is hard. I get this clinical practice question all the time because I, the most common one that we all use in terms of drug therapies is metformin. It's been the most for insulin resistant for prevention of incident diabetes. But like, as I told you, the data for its ability um, to improve 
histologic outcomes in NAFLD and NASH is not as strong. That does not mean that metformin does not have a very important therapeutic role in this population. It just may not move the needle on histology as much um, and, and, and may not do much above and beyond its, its ability um, to reduce insulin resistance. So I think there are some nice studies and interesting studies using the GLP-1s um, in the non-diabetes populations who have fat with inflammation and their potential role in prevention um, and through their weight loss mechanisms, but independent of their weight loss mechanisms. And I think those are important ways. And then of course, lifestyle intervention is the number one way, right? That we're going to actually reduce insulin resistance in this disease through weight loss. Well, Lisa, we've uh, come to the hour. Um, this was an absolutely fantastic doc, really enjoyed it. Um, and I wish you luck on your future endeavors and looking forward to more soon. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful rest of your day.